All right. <clears throat> Morning. Morning. It is really great to see you. Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Josh, for starting off our fourth annual symposium on child sexual abuse from a public health perspe perspective. Welcome to all of you who are here in the audience, and welcome to uh, those of you who are joining us via our live stream. Uh, a special welcome to our international attendees, uh, most of whom are via live stream. Uh, we have some attendees from Australia and Italy and elsewhere, and we're very excited um, to be reaching such a broad audience today. At the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse, our work focuses on child sexual abuse as a preventable public health problem. And this focus is reflected in our annual symposium. In four years of operation, our center has launched the development of three separate prevention programs. We've conducted an evaluation of the cost of child sexual abuse, and we've conducted high-impact research on the effects of public policies that aim but don't, don't always achieve the reduction in child sexual abuse. More recently, we've begun partnering with other organizations to improve how we communicate so that everyone understands that this is a preventable problem and not an inevitable problem. This year, our symposium focuses on the impact of child sexual abuse on families. To describe some of the latest research efforts in this area, we bring to you experts from Johns Hopkins University and the Kennedy Krieger Institute, both here in Baltimore, Maryland, from the Cooper Medical School of Rowan University in Camden, New Jersey, and from the University of Ottawa in Canada. Beyond research, we bring you the voices of family members, including parents and siblings of child victims and children who have caused harm, as well as the important voice of news and social media. <clears throat> which informs much of what the public understands about child sexual abuse. Each year we add something new to the symposium. Last year we began live streaming. We do so again today. This year we've added a lunch and learn session in response to your feedback, to the feedback of our audience members, stating a strong desire for opportunities to spend more time with researchers and to network among themselves. I am delighted to report that our inaugural lunch and learn sold out this year. Those who registered will receive a box lunch hear one of our speakers um, go into greater depth about his research findings and have time to network. In addition, this year, we took a page from the Wendy Clagg Autism Research Center's uh, <clears throat> symposium and we've added student poster um, presentations. Those will be open to everyone following the Lunch and Learn, and I'll say more about when and where that is. Um, before introducing our first speaker, a few more housekeeping notes. Your folders contain today's agenda. Please note that we've scheduled breaks for the mid-morning and also mid-afternoon. And also please note there's a note card for writing down questions. <clears throat> These are for our afternoon panel. So again, I'll say more of that when we come back after lunch. We've also included a survey for you to complete after the symposium ends. Um, the data that we get from that survey is absolutely critical and crucial, and we hope you'll take just a few moments to fill it out. It's just a few items. Now it's my great great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Ryan Shields. Dr. Shields joined the Moore Center and the Department of Mental Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health as an assistant scientist three years ago. He obtained his doctorate in criminology and criminal justice from Florida State University in 2013. And prior to that, he completed bachelor's and master's degree programs at the University of Baltimore. And so Ryan, Dr. Shields, is a native of our beautiful city. <clears throat> and it's a beautiful day in our beautiful city, too, I must say. Thank God for spring, finally. Um, Dr. Shields is interested in the public impact of crime and crime policy and in bringing a public health approach to these issues. His work includes examining the impact of extrajudicial factors, factors that should not matter but that often do, on criminal justice outcomes. For example, he recently received funding to look at the impact of gender, race, sexual orientation on arrest, conviction, and in, um, imprisonment. He's also engaged in research on policies that pertain to the commercial sexual exploitation of children and to policies that pertain to youth who have engaged in harmful behaviors. Today, as our first research presenter, Dr. Shields will describe one of our center's key prevention programs, our Help Wanted Project. Specifically, he summarizes interviewees' descriptions of how their unwanted attraction to younger children impacted their family relationships and what they had to say about what might have supported them when they were, themselves were adolescents. Dr. Shields is also our Lunch and Learn presenter this year. During that session, he will provide additional details on our Help Wanted, Wanted project. Won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Shields. <laughs> 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 
So uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, I am from Baltimore, so I will try and keep that lovely Baltimore accent <laughs> kind of reined in uh, throughout the talk. Um, I want to I wanna thank everyone for coming, right, and being engaged in the work of the Moore Center and having an interest and a passion for child sexual abuse prevention. Um, it's wonderful seeing uh, those returning faces who support our work year after year, and it's also really great to see the new faces out there. So I hope you enjoy today's um, talks. So I'm going to begin um, describing a uh, prevention intervention that we are developing in the Moore Center, um, specifically for adolescents who have a sexual attraction to young children. Uh, my focus today, though, will be on their experiences with um, the impact of their attraction on their families, their family experiences, and what they're looking for from their families. So just to give a little roadmap, uh, I'll uh, give some background information for the, this concept and talk about our larger Help Wanted project, and then get into the specific study, which involves uh, qualitative interviews with young adults who are um, self-identify as pedophiles, who have a sexual attraction to young children, and then I'll talk about the future directions for this work. So, in a review of, of the, the literature on, on pedophilia, um, it, this is an, an emerging area, right? This is sort of like new science. So if we take a step back and just look at child sexual abuse in general, right? Um, what we see is roughly a third to half of cases of child sexual abuse are committed by other youth. And I think that, that's a striking statistic, right? Um, I don't think that's well known. We don't hear that often in the public narrative that a lot of sexual harm is committed by other youth. And of course, then the question is why? Why does that happen, right? And the motivation behind youth engaging in sexually abusive behaviors is varied. But one possible motivation is that adolescents, these adolescents are sexually attracted to young children, right? Um, James Cantor's work um, suggests that perhaps this attraction sort of develops in utero but it emerges in adolescence, right, in puberty, when other sexual preferences emerge, for example, gender preference, right, that an attraction to children first shows itself in adolescence. And youth who are recognizing this <clears throat> struggle to understand what that means for them. They often seek help, but are unable to find any. So like, let's, let's think about that for a second, right? So, at a, a, a systems level, at a policy level, what we're saying is that there has to be harm first before we intervene. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. We can do better, right? We can do better. And this is what we believe at the Moore Center, that child sexual abuse is preventable. It is preventable, and we want to participate in the development of those prevention programs. So um, we were introduced to this concept of adolescents who had a sexual attraction to children, looking for help, can't find any. We were introduced to that by way of Luke Malone. Luke Malone's a journalist out of Columbia, and for his thesis, he was writing about this, uh, this concept. He, he talked to uh, young people who were uh, who self-identified as having a sexual attraction to children and were really struggling with, with navigating that process. Um, and his pieces appeared in This American Life and then also Matter magazine. Uh, raise your hand if you've listened, listened to the show or, or read the article. Um, it's beautiful work, and I absolutely recommend um, Googling uh, This American Life. It's Tarred and Feathered is the name of that episode. And then um, his, his piece in Matter Magazine. Really beautiful work sort of describing, uh, describing this problem. And he reached out to Elizabeth Letourneau, and um, that is how we were introduced to this, this notion of um, they're needing uh, a, a systems-level response before harm occurs, that need. Right. And so from those conversations with Luke and from uh, speaking with the individuals that he was in contact with, uh, we uh, worked to develop um, an, it, uh, an approach to deal with this problem that we call the Help Wanted Project. Um, the Help Wanted Project is to design an intervention for adolescents who are, sex who are sexually attracted to young children. Um, for two purposes. One, to prevent 
young people from acting on the sexual attraction, but then two, to make sure that they themselves get the help they need to live happy and healthy lives, right? And so in order to develop this intervention, the first step is talking to people, right? Figuring out what are the needs. And so phase one is a set of qualitative interviews with young adults between the ages of 18 and 30 who identify as having a sexual attraction to children that emerged in adolescence, um, and figuring out how did they manage this, how did they navigate these waters, and what could have been available, had it been available, that would have been helpful. So um, we uh, essentially we were in contact after after the uh, this American Life piece and the Matter article came out. We were contacted by um, by young people, by young adults who. Uh, have a sexual attraction to children and we're looking for help and, and wanting to talk about their experiences. And so we designed a, a qualitative uh, interview um, around uh, this idea. We also posted um, a link to our study on Virtuous Pedophiles. Virtuous Pedophiles, or Verped, is uh, an online community of non-offending pedophiles who sort of work together to be a, a support system for each other. Um, and so uh, we um, set up anonymous call in line and uh, really talked with these people for between an hour and an hour and a half to ask them when did you know that you were attracted to children and how did that present itself and when it did how did you react who did you tell and, and how did you how did you manage that on a day-to-day -day basis we also asked them after we completed the interviews um, to complete an online survey and so that online survey had some demographic questions and had um, uh, some um, questions related to their early childhood experiences and also their um, feelings around participating in the study. So before taking it, how did you feel? And then after having completed the interview, how do you feel? Because we wanted to you know, make sure that what we're doing here is helpful for them as well, for our participants. And we're analyzing the results um, using a, a grounded theory approach. So that's kind of where you talk to lots of people and you try and understand, you develop a theory around a process. So the process of recognizing an attraction and then dealing with that attraction. So today I'm going to present our preliminary results. We have 12 interviews completed and analyzed. Um, and then we have overall 26 completed interviews. So the, the, the remainder are still in the process of, of analysis. But I'm going to present some preliminary results from our first 12. Um, only of, of the 12, only 11 completed the, the online component. So some of the de demographic information reflects that. And so five of our participants identified as heterosexual. Um, and uh, the remainder um, are defined themselves. Uh, three were bisexual. Uh, one identified as gay, and then another identified as uh, queer. And then finally, our last participant identified as uh, minor attracted. So straight dash minor attracted was how he framed his, his orientation. Um, we had respondents from across the US, but then also some folks from Australia and, and the UK. We asked our respondents to, um, to talk about the, their attraction and the exclusivity of their attraction. So two of our respondents were, primary, were exclusively attracted to children. Um, so they had no attraction to um, same age peers. Uh, the rest were primarily attracted to children, but also were able to engage in, um, in, in, in same age uh, uh, relationships and same age attractions. And so four of our respondents reported having been in a romantic relationship with an adult, but one, only one was currently in a romantic relationship with adult, but still expressed sexual interest in children. So before I talk about the impacts on families, um, I wanted to just describe the process of recognizing the attraction. I think that's an important thing um, to, to keep in your mind as we, as we talk about the impacts on, on families. So typically, 10, between the ages of 10 and 14, was the peak time for recognizing that they were sexually attracted to young children. Um, they didn't necessarily connect that with the label of pedophilia. Rather, they were sort of recognizing that the people that they were attracted to, the individuals they were attracted to, were much younger than the people their friends were attracted to. And so almost they were recognizing their feelings without recognizing what those feelings meant at a larger social, issue, uh, social level, right? 
what it meant for their position in society. This process was often slow. This didn't, it wasn't a wake up one day and suddenly completely understand it, right? This was a slow process. Um, they started recognizing that they liked hanging out with kids, right? Hanging out, being friends with young kids was, was fun and engaging for them. Um, they would, uh, in conversations with their peers about who was attractive, they would recognize that the folks that they were attracted to were not what their friends were talking about, right? So their friends would mention uh, a celebrity that they thought was attractive, and that person didn't connect, connect with that. And the people that he liked were the younger, less developed girls at, at the school. So sort of recognizing, hmm, some, something's different. Again, recognizing the feelings, not necessarily knowing what those feelings meant. Um, they also talked about, as they sort of began to reflect on, on their attraction, recognizing that it was really structured around a young look, more so than a gender, for example. That the um, attraction to the youthful appearance um, was something that they were connecting with. Um, for many of our folks, they have varied reactions to recognizing this attraction. Because at first, it emerged in adolescence, the age gap was much smaller. So at first it wasn't as troubling. Then as they aged, as they moved throughout adolescence, they recognized that that gap widened, that the people they were attracted to really didn't change. And this is when it became stressful because now they're starting to connect their feelings with the term pedophilia and recognizing that that could be them. When that happened, that was a stressful time for our participants, recognizing that this is me. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to abuse someone, right? That's um, one, of, one of the things our, our uh, one participant mentioned was that they were worried about offending. Not because they thought that their risk, they were at risk of offending or they wanted to offend, but rather the message is if you are a pedophile, then you will offend. That's how we describe that in the public narrative. And so recognizing that you were sexually attracted to young children for this individual meant that he was destined to cause harm against a child. And that was incredibly stressful for him navigating his adolescence with that on his mind. So much of their, um, much of the process of acknowledging their attraction is really centered around understanding their new identity, right? Understanding this identity and what it means in terms of what's going to happen to them. Um, so as much as I can, I'm going to use the words of our participants to talk about these issues, because I think they can frame it a lot better than, than, than I can. Um, and so if you see me staring down, it's just because I'm reading a quote. Um, once they recognized that they were sexually attracted to young children, that they were identifying as pedophiles, then they needed to wrestle with the question of, do I tell my family? How do I tell my family? So many of our respondents didn't, didn't, didn't disclose in adolescence. Right? They did not tell anyone when they were in adolescence. Partly because, one, they didn't understand the attraction enough to be able to articulate it, to be able to describe it to their families. Um, again, some weren't as concerned. During adolescence, it was only when they were in their older teen years that they were like, wait a minute. No, this is bad. So the, pro the process of disclosure is really one that is varied across our participants, and it usually stems from how they're feeling in that moment. So when those feelings become too intense, right, when one participant described it as being um, at the breaking point, he had issues, he uh, had issues with employment, um, not related to his attraction, but he had to move back in with his family, and it was only at that point, at his lowest moment, that he felt like he needed to begin the process of disclosure to sort of build a foundation, right? Um, but many of our, our respondents didn't. So one of them, um, I'm gonna pull the quote. Sorry, 
have the, uh, the mouse is not working, so I have paper quotes as a backup. <laughs> Okay, so uh, one of our participants, we're going to call him Joe. We're using um, all uh, just um, uh, anonymous uh, names. But um, Joe says the reason why he didn't disclose. It elicits a very strong emotional response from people. So I think the biggest part of my fear was that I wouldn't be able to talk long enough to actually describe my situation to people. Because as soon as you say that, it's a split-second kind of opinion, and then you're branded. Once you're branded, you can't talk to people from a neutral position. Um, I didn't want to be ostracized or rejected from my family. I didn't want to lose those relationships. I didn't want to lose my friends. I didn't want to have to go out of school. I didn't want to go to jail because I didn't know whether my thoughts were legal or not. I was worried that people wouldn't want to try to understand it. They, wouldn't, they would just want to put me away where I wouldn't be at risk for anyone. And so when people finally did disclose, they often disclosed to their families first, right? Um, the reactions from families were varied. Uh, so some of our participants described having quite positive reactions. So one of our participants articulated, as soon as he said the words, I'm attracted to children, his parents got up and hugged them immediately, like before he could say anything else. And by doing that, that instant level of support he felt safe to then actually talk about the details. Like, what does this mean? So for him, the disclosure process was a positive one, right? Because it was that instantaneous support, that in instantaneous comment of, we love you, nothing changes. And by doing that, that opened the doors for more complicated questions about how are we gonna manage this? How are we gonna, how are we gonna navigate this? Um, others reported less positive reactions, right? So in, in one heartbreaking um, story, um, one of our participants at 17 was writing in a diary about his attractions. And his parents um, found the diary and kicked him out of the house. And they were part of a, a small church community, and he was kicked out of that church community. Um, so he went to live with another family member, but that wasn't a support system, right? That wasn't a support system for him. And in hearing these two people talk about their future, it's very different, right? The individual who had the parent support is hopeful, is hopeful. The young man who was kicked out of his house was struggling to find any hope for his future. And so one of our participants um, actually um, described that difference about those who tell their families and those who don't. So um, Kevin says, um, I think I'm able to see the direct correlation between people who openly talk with their parents about it and people who refuse to talk to their parents about it. I can see that it has a huge effect on the self-worth of that person. The people who don't have that kind of self-worth, I feel, are the people who struggle to decide whether they actually want to and might end up doing something that they will regret. We also asked our participants, what would you like from your parents? What do you need from your parents? And above everything, they needed support. They wanted support. They wanted acceptance. The line that nearly every single participant said was, I just want them to tell me that they love me and that nothing changes, right? And I think that's a universal theme, right? Like think about our own tough conversations that we've had with our, our parents growing up, right? Isn't that, isn't that the theme that connects everything? We just, we just want to know that our parents will love us and nothing changes. Um, but support also has some very concrete examples that they're looking for, right? And so one participant described what, like wanting the initial, like having that first conversation and being supportive during that time, but then also having uh, sustained support, so taking them to therapy or talking about different dimensions of the attraction, right? So sort of very concrete examples and not shying away from those difficult conversations. They also wanted to be praised for coming forward. So I thought that was interesting. Right, one of the things they wanted to hear from their parents, even the people who, who didn't hear this from their parents said, 
They wanted to be thanked, to be told that they were proud, that they had the bravery to, to come forward and also to seek help. Right? They wanted that acknowledged. They also wanted parents to be able to have open discussions just about things of a sexual nature in general. So we recognize the difficulty of having these conversations in families, right? And that in some families, those open lines of communications around sex are just not there. And so what they're looking for is a broader, um, uh, broader discussions with their parents to be able to talk about this particular difficult topic, but then also issues related to sex as, you know, more broadly. They also, and this is important, wanted parents to be aware, to be aware of pedophilia, to be aware of what that means, right? And so one participant described um, wanting to tell his mom and dad for quite some time that he was sexually attracted to children and was sort of trying to psych himself up to do that, to have that conversation. And they were watching TV, and uh, a news story came on and, uh, about a, a pedophile who had been arrested. And his mom was like, oh, God, evil, evil. And so then he shrunk back, right? So the participants that we talk to are looking for their parents to be sort of aware of these, these questions that we're confronting today in the symposium to have a level of awareness and education, and to be careful of how they describe people who have a sexual attraction to children, right? So for their, uh, in, in their mind, um, hearing their mom or dad endorse the notion that pedophilia equals child sexual abuse, that one necessarily <laughs> results in the other, is a harmful thing for them. And it also cuts off that line of communication to be able to come out and talk to them. We recognize, of course, that this is going to be difficult for parents, right? To be able to have these conversations. One, kids don't love talking about sex with their parents in general. As a general rule, it doesn't appear to be uh, the case. Um, and even among quote unquote perfect parents, our respondents were aware of the fact that these are big asks, right? But it's important, I think, then, to develop tools to assist parents, right? To give people the resources they need to make this more likely to happen. And then I also wanted to talk just quickly about um, one of our participants who uh, is a recent father. And this is something that we didn't exactly expect when we started to develop this study. One, because we were focusing on young adults, so 18, 18 to 30, and it just wasn't um, one of the things that we had um, thought about before we, we started it. And for him, um, this idea of fatherhood was, one, the, he said the best thing that happened to him, becoming a father. But then, two, he really had to confront some important questions, right? He really had to confront some important questions. So one, the first question he had when he learned he was going to be a father was, what if I'm attracted to my daughter? What do I do? What happens? And so now hearing him after his daughter, after his daughter was born, he says the idea of being attracted, it doesn't compute with him, right? That there's zero attraction whatsoever, and he doesn't understand how that could possibly be. But before, he was worried about it. So now, one of the things that he's worried about, okay, well, what happens when she starts to have friends come over to, and hang out at the house? And so I think that highlights sort of the life course perspective that people need to take, right? Like, it's not once you become aware and potentially disclose, well, you're good to go, right? No. It's something that they're struggling with to, to navigate throughout their life course because new challenges come up. Um, and he also talked about the lack of discussion about this issue, about becoming a parent in the online communities for non-offending pedophiles, 
right? That th this, this question really isn't discussed at a broader level. So he says, um, it's, rarely it's rarely talked about, these guys having children of their own. Some of, the, some of them, of course, don't because they're exclusively attracted to children. They're just not going to end up in a relationship where they do go on to become a parent. Um, but I think it needs to be talked about because it can shed further light on what men like me are as human beings, the kind of relationships we form, and how we approach parenthood. So I thought that was a nice way to, um, to kind of talk about that, that life course um, perspective in, the, in this area. So just to give a, a quick summary of, of what we learned um, about the impacts on families, um, respondents often struggle, describe struggling with uh, coming to, coming, not only coming to terms, but um, deciding when and how to disclose to their parents and families. Um, we had varied reactions. One reaction that I thought was interesting was um, after, a, um, after one of the guys we spoke to told his sister, his sister was supportive, didn't quite understand it, but wanted to be there for him. And then after a while came back and said, you know, knowing that you are a pedophile has changed the way I think about pedophiles. Because before it was these you know, monsters in the shadows. But now, it's her brother. So what does that mean? What does that mean for their relationship? I thought that was an, that was an interesting way to think about, from the family perspective, um, constructing sort of those relationships of the future. And the, the people we talked to uh, suggested, you know, they're really just looking for help and support from their families, right? But families need the resources to help. I think. Um, for any one of us, if our, if our children came to us and said that they were sexually attracted to children, that would be something that we would not quite exactly be prepared to deal with long term, right? Not many people have to, conf have to confront that question. Um, and so we need to, so that for those who do, we need to give them resources, right? We need to help them. And then also a, a focus, as the, the, um, the one man I just described mentioned, a focus on um, sort of these issues don't stop in adolescence or in early adulthood, but rather this is a, a long-term life course thing. And so we need to th think about that in terms of understanding and, and developing interventions. And I also just wanted to end with um, a, sort of a description of our project more broadly, kind of where we're going in the future. And so uh, we have 26 completed interviews. We are stopping at 30 and then reevaluating to see if we've reached saturation of um, thematic content. Um, if not, we'll continue with interviews. And um, what we're really learning, uh, we're learning a lot from these people. Um, the Lunch and Learn uh, this uh, afternoon, for those of you who are attending, um, we'll go into some of those, those details. But uh, we've really had a great experience with um, with talking and reaching out to these individuals. And they're really informing our own thoughts about how to develop an intervention. Right? So that's the next step. Phase two will be getting our colleagues together to review the findings of these interviews, to start thinking about, OK, what are the, what are the treatment areas that we need to focus on? What kind of intervention will we develop? It probably has to be online, right? This is a hidden group. Um, that often seeks help online, so on, the online community seems to be the place to do it, right? But it's not just for adolescents who are sexually attracted to children. There need to be resources for parents and families and peers and treatment providers, right? Because we're all learning about this world right now. This is, this is, this is new for many people. And then once that intervention is developed, we want to do an initial evaluation and then um, a feasibility study and then project four would involve a randomized control trial to make sure what we're doing is actually effective, right? And so phase one, the interview part of this project, has been funded through the Moore Center, right? It's our, our, our passion project, it's, it's our heart. But to be able to do the next three steps, that's where we need funding, right? Um, and fund, funding this kind of development um, is difficult, has proven difficult, but it's absolutely necessary in order to reach each of these uh, outcomes, right, and have a resource that's useful and available for youth. So I really want to thank you for, um, for listening, and um, here's
Here's my email address. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, so feel free to t tweet. Um, and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it.